Hi, welcome to Brown Bag History for May 8th, 2020. Today is the 75th anniversary of victory in Europe uh, from the Second World War, and that's the, the topic today. Uh, before we started this, I'd like to acknowledge that we are on the territory of the Alcinaics, the Silks, the Tanaha, and the Sequipnik. So before the war started, uh, which was in September of 1939, there was certainly rumors of war. There was certainly people were, were anxious and concerned about the rise of Hitler and Nazism in, uh, in Germany. And uh, there were certainly signals that the world was, was headed towards a, a war. So before, sort of in the middle of all that anxiety, uh, King George VI and Queen Elizabeth who, the, who became the Queen Mother. At the, the time, she was known as Queen Elizabeth, the mother of our current Queen. Uh, they came on a Canadian royal tour, and they stopped in Revelstoke, and, uh, and this was in the end of May of 1939, and it was a huge, huge, huge event. Uh, I think people were uh, wanting to get comfort from the fact that the, the royal family was visiting, and uh, just that feeling that the, the, the king and queen are in Canada, the king and queen are telling us that, that everything will be okay. Uh, there was that feeling of patriotism and uh, solidarity. So in Revelstoke alone, there were 9,000 people that were here to watch the, the king and uh, queen as they, they came through. And that was about double of the, the population. So there were people who came up from the Kootenays and from the Okanagan, because this was one of their major stops in the area. So they did come out and have a, a visit with people. It was pouring rain. You can see some umbrellas in there and people with coats over, over top of themselves. It was a very, very wet day. Uh, that They even said that the uh, Queen was in tears when she saw some of the very old people who'd been waiting in the rain for hours to, to see them. Uh, but certainly that was a um, sort of a pivotal point uh, for the Canadian people. It's a picture of them on the, the back of their, their private car. So there was definitely an increase in uh, militia activity in the area. The Rocky Mountain Rangers, which had had a local company since 1898 and had been active mostly as uh, bridge guards during the First World War, was uh, again recruiting uh, their uh, militia. And there was a note in the paper of, from June 23rd of 1939 saying that the D Company of Rocky Mountain Rangers was assembling at Camp Vernon. The 54 men and one officer of D Company, the local unit of the Rocky Mountain Rangers, left this morning for Vernon, where they will enter military training exercises. They will return home about July 2nd. So there was that, that increase in awareness and, and uh, military activity. But it wasn't until uh, September uh, of uh, 1939 that uh, war was announced. It was actually, uh, well, it was announced on <clears throat> September 1st, and there was a previous issue of the paper on September 1st. Uh, they hadn't had official announcements at that time, but they, everybody knew that this was imminent. And the September 1st issue said, uh, scenes reminiscent of great war days were seen around town. The news and broadcasts and speeches were listened to avidly. And said the local commercial office of the CPR was a rendezvous for many who had been anxious to glimpse the latest from the CPR train bulletins, and that large numbers of people were gathered outside the CPR telegraph office, where two loudspeakers carried the address of Anthony Eden out into the space of Mackenzie Avenue. On the afternoon of August 26th, the D Company of the uh, uh, Rocky Mountain Rangers assembled in the drill hall and they were uh, seeking volunteers for home defense. It uh, said uh, on the, the, the uh, September 1st issue, it said, that Saturday evening khaki uniforms were mingling with the civilian attire of the Saturday night crowds. Well, at 10 o'clock that same night, 
members of the unit mounted guard at the CPR bridge across the Columbia River. So just as during the First World War, bridge guards were on duty uh, because the uh, railway bridges were seen as a, a prime target for uh, enemy attack. In the uh, January 8th newspaper, said uh, Prime Minister Chamberlain announces that a state of war now exists with Germany in a speech carried on the radio at 3 a.m. Sunday morning, September 3rd. He mentioned that many rebel Stokings had stayed awake to hear the news. The newspaper said uh, old timers were reminded of the last war when bulletins appeared on the windows of McDonald's drugstore every Friday. During the days of 1914 to 1918, most of the important events of that crisis were recounted on the same window. This time, large crowds are daily following the bulletins, despite the fact that the radio provides a more diversified source of information than was possible through the ordinary news service of 25 years ago. And that also mentioned that the company of the RMR had expanded their activities to more areas of the district. Uh, the women of the community were being encouraged to form a women's emergency corps. And uh, that group later became part of the local Red Cross and they were very active during the war, sending parcels and doing fundraising activities. A um, editorial in the September 15th issue noted some differences between the First World War and the, the current uh, crisis of 1939. It said there was no excitement as there had been in 1914. That there was quiet and assurance, soberness and determination. It said this is not merely war against Germany. <clears throat> It is a war of democracy against Hitlerism, against dictatorship, against aggression, a war for the right of free peoples to live their own lives without fear. There is a grim determination about this war. There is no bandwagon, no slogan about the war to end war. There is a determination that the German menace shall be crushed for all time. Another difference was that although the rebel Stoke population was about the same, it was now smaller in Revelstoke in relation to other communities. So in 1914, the population of around 4,000 was actually one of the larger centers in the interior of the province, along with Nelson and Kamloops. So, but even though the population was around the same in the 1930s, a lot of the other communities were, had been growing bigger. So places like Kelowna and uh, Vernon and, and Kamloops were getting bigger in population. So Revelstoke was getting to have more of a smaller town feel than it had had in its earlier days. There was also a more settled population here and families who had been here since the early 1900s. Not as many transient workers as there had been in 1914 and many more Canadian born soldiers. In the First World War, the majority of the men, certainly from Revelstoke who enlisted, had been born in Great Britain. So there was notes in the paper about the uh, soldiers um, coming and going. Uh, on December 29th, it uh, remarked, reported that some of the soldiers who had enlisted had been home for Christmas leave, that uh, Revelstoke soldiers belonging to the RMR and who have come off guard duty in the Kamloops area, returned to Kamloops en route to, to join another unit at the coast Wednesday night, and also mentioned that three local men were serving overseas in the Royal Air Force and also some had enlisted with the Royal Canadian Air Force. The first Canadian flyers to go overseas were uh, Russell Donaldson, and uh, he had uh, gone to England and joined the RAF two years previously, and uh, had, or was already serving uh, in France. Malcolm McFadden was formerly of Revelstoke and uh, had moved to Kamloops and he joined up with the RAF. And Howard Cottrell, uh, was the son of the assistant general manager of the CPR and had been born in, in Revelstoke and they also signed up. Uh, they, uh, uh, McFadden and Cotterell were actually already commercial flyers at Calgary and Winnipeg uh, when they uh, joined up. Revelstoke's uh, first fatality uh, happened in 
It was reported on uh, April 16, 1940, when the first uh, Rebel Stoke man died. That was uh, George Perry. And uh, he was a member of the Royal Air Force and uh, was uh, missing, believed, drowned. It said, word reached the parents of the young aviator from the war office Tuesday morning. It is believed that he was a member of one of two planes, which were reported shot down over the North Sea on April 15th. Born in Revelstoke 28 years ago, George attended school here, took an active interest in, in athletics, and one of, was one of the city's most popular young men. He had worked in mines in the Lardo country and the Similkameen in recent years, and early last summer left from the coast with a group of recruits for the Royal Air Force. And uh, he left uh, six sisters as well as his parents. Uh, there was also a note in the review of June 6, 1940, saying that uh, the uh, word was received that the Rocky Mountain Rangers had been asked to raise a complement of 15 officers and 300 men for overseas service. It is understood that most of the men will go to the Duke of Connaught's own rifles, 1st BC Regiment, Vancouver. The local company had already contributed men to other units, such as the 1st Division, and uh, on the, some were on the prairies with reinforcements for the 1st and 2nd Divisions, and a large number were serving in Victoria with the 16th Canadian Scottish. In uh, July of uh, 1940, it said the RMRs were setting up a military camp and recreation park, and that's now the playing field area of uh, Queen Elizabeth Park. It said about 30 to 35 men will come over from Kamloops as soon as the camp is established. While most of the men are from Revelstoke, there will be a number from Okanagan points. It also mentioned at that time that any aliens of German or Italian racial origin who had become naturalized British subjects since the first day of September 1920 were to report for registration. That these persons are not allowed to possess firearms and ammunition or any other explosives. These persons must immediately surrender all firearms and explosives. No one may give these aliens any of these pre prohibited items. So there were some restrictions on uh, people who had uh, come here from uh, from uh, Germany and uh, Italy since 1920. Um, there were quite a few um, children that were sent over to Canada from England during the war. Uh, there was uh, one that we know of that uh, came to Revelstoke. Her name was Mary Pick, and uh, she was a, a teenage girl who was the niece of Lieutenant and Mrs. E. A. Boyle, who lived in Revelstoke. And uh, she uh, went to, to school here. She was actually in the same class as uh, Helen Grace, and uh, she was very popular. I believe she ended up being the valedictorian for her high school class. Um, after the attack on Pearl Harbor in December of 1941 and the declaration of war against Japan, all Japanese people living in Canada, including Canadian citizens of Japanese descent, were moved away from the Vancouver coast into the interior. Many were put into internment camps while other families moved independently to interior communities, such as Revelstoke, but they were not allowed to live in, in the city limits. They had to get housing outside of the city, but at that time, Big Eddie and anywhere south of Downey Street were outside of the city limits, so they, they could settle in those areas. There were also work camps established for a single men, including several between Revelstoke and Sycamus, where, where road work was undertaken. Local soldiers. In uh, June of uh, 1940, the Big Bend Highway was completed. It had been under construction for quite a few years, and uh, construction was really slowed down during the uh, economic constraints of the Great Depression. Uh, but uh, it was almost finished in 1939. There was uh, a couple of stretches that still had to be completed. But with the um, start of the war, there was a real push to get it completed because they uh, wanted to be able to use the highway for the moving of, uh, of convoys of um, military equipment. So finally, on uh, 
June 29th, 1840, the highway was uh, was officially opened, and this is the ceremony at Bowdoin Encampment from that date. This is um, Jack Hallam, who was uh, one of the uh, local recruits, and uh, he spent a lot of uh, his war service in Italy and North Africa. We have quite a bit of uh, his uh, records and his medals and uh, other memorabilia. So during World War II, the Kinsman Club uh, was really active in keeping up the community spirit. They came up with the idea of um, Golden Spike Days, which uh, started in 1944. Uh, they were working with the, uh, they had the Board of Trade, were trying to encourage uh, tourist traffic to Revelstoke over the newly opened Big Bend Highway. They were doing what they could to uh, keep the economy uh, active and to, to uh, keep the, the community um, morale up as well. This was a group called the Revelstoke Servicemen's Hostess Club. So when they were uh, visiting servicemen in town, they would uh, help uh, provide entertainment. If there were dances, they'd make sure that the soldiers always had dance partners um, and just doing what, what they could. They were also uh, sending parcels to the, the servicemen as well. Uh, one of the things that the Kinsman Club did was um, during World War II, they, um, at uh, Halloween every year, because of the, the rationing that was underway, uh, people couldn't get candy to hand out to the children. So uh, the Kinsman Club came up with an idea where the local residents could buy uh, tickets from the Kinsman Club. So when the kids came trick-or-treating, they'd get a ticket, and then they could go to, to the Civic Center which was the old YMCA building where the city parking lot is now on 1st Street East. And they could redeem their tickets for little prizes and for hot dogs and have a, a, a Halloween party. So they were doing, doing that sort of, of thing. Uh, they uh, also were sponsoring some of, some of the fundraising in town. One of the big things that was going on during the war was the sale of victory bonds where you could buy a, a bond and the proceeds of that would go towards the, the war effort. There were, um, I think, about eight campaigns of, of uh, victory bond sales that went on during the war. So um, this was the victory bond uh, parade in the Golden Spike Days, or uh, float in the Golden Spike Days parade from 1944. And uh, one of the campaigns of the Kinsman Club was Milk for Britain. Um, there were, as I said, there was rationing in Canada, but there were, weren't the food shortages that people were experiencing in, uh, in Europe and in, in Britain. Uh, so uh, the Kinsman was part of this uh, campaign to make sure that the children in Britain were able to get supplies of milk. So that was their their milk for Britain campaign. So there was also um, uh, women who were in uh, service during the uh, Second World War. Uh, quite a few local women signed up with the Canadian Women's Army Corps and with women's branches of the Navy and Air Force. They were all non-combat doing jobs like communications, uh, driving, nursing, um, and then locally there were women who were taking over uh, traditionally men's jobs such as working on uh, the, some of the, the crews on the, for the CPR, doing things like uh, doing the icing the cars, the refrigerator cars, that, those sorts of jobs. So finally on June 8th, 1944, the Revelstoke Review had a hopeful headline that made Revelstoke residents feel that the tide was turning. The invasion reports excite citizens. Revelstoke hears long-awaited news of invasion Monday night. And that article stated that the D-Day invasion of June 6th was proceeding according to plan, saying the capture of the town of Bayou, the first French city to fall to the Allied forces, has given the invading armies an important initial success, which may soon be developed into further important gains. The, the uh, service was held on uh, 
in St. Peter's Anglican Church on June 7th, followed by a second service in the United Church. And uh, the newspaper noted that many rebel soldiers, sailors, and airmen were taking part in D-Day, and thoughts for their safety have been uppermost. There was one rebel stoke man, Ernest Phillips, who died on June 11, 1944, as a result of wounds received on D-Day. He was 37 years old and had come to Revelstoke with his parents in 1920, went to school here, and went on to work in his father's painting and decorating business. He enlisted in 1941 with the 2nd Battalion Canadian Scottish and left for England in uh, September of 1942. He got married in Brighton, England in 1943 and had been looking forward to bringing his wife to Revelstoke uh, to make their home here after the war. The newspaper report on his death said he had a quiet and pleasing personality and a voice of considerable charm. D-Day, of course, was a turning point in the war with the, with the Axis, but the conflict wasn't over at that point. Um, so during the course of the war, 33 people from Revelstoke died and they're commemorated on our local cenotaph. Five of those deaths occurred in the last few months of the conflict. They included uh, Herbert Arnold, who died uh, February 25th, 1945. Uh, he died one day after his 21st birthday when he was shot down over the Irish Sea. He was uh, with the Royal Canadian Air Force. Uh, Alfred Chilton died March 6th, 1945 in battle. He was with the Royal Canadian Engineers, buried in Grosbeek Canadian War Cemetery in the Netherlands. Uh, he lived in Kregalaki. His uh, wife was a daughter of the Marlowe family from Beaton. Um, he had a young son, Alfred, at the time of his death. Stuart Arthur McKinley died April 15, 1945, uh, at the age of 23. He was uh, died of wounds at the, the Western Front and was buried in the Grosbeek Canadian War Cemetery in the Netherlands. He was born in Saskatchewan in 1921 and came to Revelstoke in 1937. He enlisted in September of 1942. He saw extensive service in Italy and then was moved to the Western Front a few months prior to his death. There is an enduring memorial to him. Mount McKinley, northwest of Mount Darling, south of Revelstoke, was named after him. Arnold Douglas Hedstrom died on April 16, 1945, at the age of 22. He was serving as a leading sick bay attendant on the Corvette Esquimalt when it was sunk in the Atlantic by a German submarine on April 16, 1945. Hedstrom had been born in Revelstoke. His grandfather, Gus Hedstrom, was an early settler and worked as a miner and trapper. His father, Doug Hedstrom, was a veteran of World War I and was also serving overseas during the Second War. Arnold's brother was in the Navy and the sister was in uh, the women's division of the RCAF. Carmen Christy Caponero died on April 21st, 1945, at the age of 31. He was the last Revelstoke man to die. He was uh, with the Canadian Scottish Regiment, the son of Angelo and Mary Caponero, and the husband of Amy Caponero of Vancouver. Uh, the newspaper said, local boy leaves wife, two small children, and parents in Revelstoke. Lance Corporal Carmen Christie Caponero had been killed in action in Germany. He went to Revelstoke schools and worked in Vancouver before enlisting. He had been overseas for seven months. So finally, it was announced that the Allies gained victory in Europe on May 8th, 1945, known as the Victory in Europe Day with Nazi Germany's unconditional surrender of its armed forces. The Revelstoke Review of May 10th, 1945 carried the headline, Revelstoke rejoices as war ends in Europe this week. And it went on to say, after many false alarms, victory came in the European theater of war Monday morning at 2.41, almost, after almost six years of blazing warfare. A broadcast at one o'clock by acting Prime Minister J.L. Ilsley made the announcement official, and Revelstoke observed the holiday for the rest of the afternoon, as well as on Tuesday. Flags appeared in homes and business places were quick in getting out decorations. The big flag of the 8th Victory Loan stood outside of the Victory Loan office. 
A reminder to everyone that the loan was still vital to the success of the second phase of the struggles, the war against Japan. The annual inspection of Rotary's Air Cadet Squadron Monday afternoon contributed a holiday atmosphere to the day. In the evening, a free dance given by the kinsmen at the Civic Center attracted a large crowd. Many people went to the church services Tuesday to observe the occasion with prayer and thanksgiving. It mentioned in the paper that uh, about 500 men and women had enlisted from Revelstoke, that a large number of these had been through the campaigns in Italy and Sicily and the battles which led up to the end in Western Europe. Revelstoke has lost many well-known sons in the cause of freedom and democracy, and their memory will be enshrined with that of the 990-odd Revelstoke men who died during the First Great War. It, um, in this issue of the paper, there were uh, quite a few ads celebrating the end of the war, and all of them were mentioning the, uh, the victory uh, the, the uh, victory loan campaigns as well. This was um, an ad, just or part of a, an ad that was taken out by the, the city of Revelstoke. And of course it includes a picture of uh, Winston Churchill with one of his famous quotes, never in the field of human conflict was so much owed by so many to so few. And uh, this is another ad from the Revelstoke Lumber and Shingle Mills Limited and Riverside Sawmills. And it says, soon after VE Day, this, the time of reunion in Canada is close at hand. Let us rejoice and praise God for the courage of our fighting forces to whom we owe this day of victory. Uh, another one from Mills, Wells Menswear. Uh, the fur press that we have in the museum downstairs came from Wells Menswear. It said, today the United Nations partners in freedom have triumphed over the tyranny of Nazism. We join in joyous thanksgiving that through God's grace, just, justice and freedom have prevailed. We pay homage to our glorious armies. Uh, as I mentioned, there was still a lot of push for the uh, victory loan campaign. There, so there were two days left of the, the current uh, campaign, which was the eighth campaign. Uh, the editorial uh, said, say thanks with bombs. The feeling of thanksgiving prevailing now that victory in Europe has been accomplished has been made possible by the courage and sacrifices of our fighting men. Say thanks the practical way, say thanks with bombs. The war against Japan has yet to be won. The men who won our freedom must, after all, be reestablished in civilian life. They've done their job. Let's show our gratitude and thankfulness by doing ours. Let there not be a community, not a village, not a city that does not exceed its victory loan quota. Let us in Revelstoke say thanks with victory bonds to the tune of record-breaking investments in the few days which remain. And it mentioned that the Revelstoke quota was $220,000 and uh, currently 178,750 had been raised. There's another uh, ad from the Revelstoke Cooperative Society. Um, there was an, an article, article um, or an, an ad uh, also encouraging people to um, buy victory bonds and it talked about how relatively well people in Revelstoke were. Yes, we had rationing, but there wasn't any real starvation here as there, as there was in Europe. And it was contrasting uh, Revelstoke with the conditions in Europe and really encouraging people to uh, buy bonds. Now, one of the things that it cited in the Revelstoke conditions was saying that we can get uh, regular deliveries from Charlie Singh on his vegetable cart and Charlie Singh was a market gardener who did uh, deliveries to Revelstoke. I posted some pictures of him just a few days ago. Uh, so even he was mentioned in, in, the, uh, in the, the local push for uh, people to buy the victory bonds. Um, there was uh, other news in the paper as well. It said that the individual sugar ration was reduced from 14 to nine ounces for the period of June 1st to December 31st. Uh, so the reduction will be made allowing consumers one pound a month instead of the present two pounds 
for June, July, August, October, and December. The Prices Board said that the September and November rations will remain at uh, two pounds to allow as much home canning as possible. That the home canning allotment of 20 preserve coupons will continue to become valid each month. Uh, this is an ad from uh, Mannings uh, saying, uh, let's finish the job. And part of it is to see that there uh, cannot be a repetition of world wars. And uh, from Loudoun's Meat Market, the Meataria and Revelstoke Meat Market. BE Day means a brighter tomorrow. So there were quite a few of ads, but a few ads like this in the paper. The Hour of Triumph. From F.G. Views, jeweler, an optometrist. Um, another note in the paper of that same issue said that um, the flying officer James Lightbaum, who was formerly of Revelstoke, had been awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross. And he was also a little um, um, human interest story. It said the Lindsay family is strong on V.E. Day, on V Day birthdays. Alderman and Mrs. P.C. Lindsay received word early on VE Day that their son and daughter-in-law, Mr. and Mrs. Victor Lindsay of Kirkland Lake, had just Ontario, had just become the parents of a daughter. The fact was of more than ordinary interest to the family. Miss Dorothy Lindsay, the new baby's aunt, was born on the last Armistice Day. an ad from the Regent Hotel, salute to our victorious armies. We join our fellow Canadians in expressing gratitude and thankfulness for victory in Europe. And another one from L.C. Mason, who had a grocery store where um, the realty office is at the corner of McKenzie and 3rd. And uh, Enterprise Brewery, which is the, the local brewery, said, proud and grateful and thankful for all you have done, the sacrifice in giving years of your time, in leaving family, in risking even life itself. And Donaldson's Drug said another one. So there, there was definitely um, an appreciation. There was relief that the war in Europe was over but there was recognition that the war was still on in uh, against Japan. So uh, there was some celebration, but it was it was quiet and more reflective. So uh, uh, this is another one from the uh, Dirty Barrett Hardware Store. And uh, Sierra McDonald's Drug Store. So uh, World War II ended with victory over Japan on August 15th, 1945. And then of course, uh, the soldiers who were still overseas started uh, to return. The uh, region, um, which is uh, the same building uh, or same location as the current region, but this was the original old hospital building that had been turned into the, 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 the legion. And uh, the cenotaph was, uh, originally erected in 1923 uh, with the names of those who died in the First World War and then they added the uh, plaque up above with 33 names of the Revelstoke men who died in World War II. And uh, after the, the war, a lot of the soldiers who returned were facing difficulties in finding housing. So the little cottages that were built between, mostly between um, Vernon and um, Victoria Road between uh, 5th Street and 8th Street were built in the, the late 40s, early 50s. And they were referred to for a long time as the wartime houses. And those were available for uh, returning soldiers to, uh, uh, to purchase. Uh, and uh, a lot of those cottages are, are still there. Uh, this was... Um, page from one of the high school annuals, uh, the year, I believe, uh, 1947 or 1948, with photographs of the local uh, men who had gone to high school and had lost their lives uh, during the war. So 
that's uh, today's talk. Uh, thank you for coming. Hopefully it won't be too long before we can uh, do this in person again.